My name is Vladislav Zubov, I'm the chair of working group for Europe and Russia of Darendorf Forum. Well, the whole idea of this meeting was to bring in people who work on the area who nevertheless uh, complement each other. Uh, because normally uh, it is done uh, along disciplinary lines. Uh, people pay lip service to the mantra of interdisciplinarity, but you know, it really rarely happens. So uh, we at the LSE have a chance to invite the best quality experts who work on the problem from the different angles. Uh, and today we, for instance, had people who could comment with high level expertise on the historical wars, the wars of memories, uh, historians, uh, on the military situation on the ground right now, on diplomatic uh, 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 evolution of, uh, of uh, European Union uh, leading towards this process, and many more other aspects. And people, uh, I think people in the audience themselves were surprised how much they learned from others. Several issues, I think, uh, stood out. First of all, um, something that we need to address is the finality of uh, the European Union. It's something that was conceived as, as a very limited uh, territorial arrangement uh, under the conditions of the Cold War. Then it sort of exploded. Then after the end of the Cold War, the idea was to unify Europe. Uh, it was achieved in part, but then, you know, what would you do with the post-Soviet states? And that ran into, into problems. So uh, geography and territoriality was not sufficiently discussed before. Uh, it, it needs to be addressed now. And, you know, uh, what we should do with uh, the countries that uh, are between Russia and the European Union today. They are not offered membership. At the same time, you know, there's, there's split identities there. And this problem uh, can easily lead, as we saw, in, into, into impasse. And, and we call this uh, conference, the title is Unpacking the Stalemate, because this stalemate has also geographical, political, and even military, unfortunately, military dimensions. Another issue that stands out is uh, how we can overcome uh, the fact that one country violated a number of international uh, agreements and treaties and that uh, creates sort of legalistic and in, uh, for many people even ethical uh, um, uh, barrier towards further negotiations that ins is insurmountable. Several times people raise the issue of trust. We no longer trust Russia. Or if we sign treaties that will be violated in the future, um, uh, trust in any diplomatic agreements with Russia over Ukraine will be diminished, not increased. We cannot afford it. So all this is important. But I think what became clear for all the participants from the very start, that there's a fundamental issue of war and peace that we're discussing. And this issue of war and peace has its own highest value dimension. I mean, after all, treaties uh, must, be ser uh, must be observed and uh, diplomacy must go on, but in the name of peace. So there are two conversations, you know, one, let's wait for five, seven years when Putin sort of is out or Russia changes his mind. But in between, if, if, if the war continues during this five, seven years, where we will end at the process? There will be Carthaginian peace. It's a peace on ruins for a large part of Eastern Europe. So that should be definitely considered. And what Lord Darendorf actually, uh, I think, meant by solving problems, A, looking out of the box, and discussing the problem out of the box and not focusing on the problem only. If the problem looks insurmountable, try to broaden your horizon, look around the problem, try to see it in a different context more creatively. Then maybe, as it was many times uh, in the history of, uh, of Europe, a European integration, a problem can be flipped and turned into an opportunity. Right now, what happens in eastern Ukraine and, uh, uh, can be only described as, as a front line where separatists armed by Russia with some involvement of Russian troops face Ukrainian army. And the discussion at the conference actually touched on some uh, sensitive dimensions uh, such as, you know, it was discussed last year and I think it's still on the agenda, whether the West should arm Ukrainian army with, with the type of weaponry that would um, disincentivize, let's say, 
um, the Russian troops who may or may not go into action this summer to, to do it. And, and the opinions were not uh, unanimous on this uh, because, after all, this is a, a stalemate that can be viewed uh, as uh, something leading to stability or the war of attrition. By war, I mean not only actual military action, but you know, political war, cyber war, information war, economic warfare. Or it can go out of control because there would be a, a, an incentive by one side to, f to break out of the stalemate, to find something. When you restore, uh, as you perceive the balance, and you think you fortify the stalemate by supplying weaponry to one side of the conflict, who knows, maybe the other side would look at, uh, at it as, uh, as an unacceptable provocation and will try to raise the antis. We saw how it happened during World War I when both sides had a stalemate on the Western Front famously or infamously and tried to break out of it by introducing new types of tactics, new types of weaponry and so on and so forth. Uh, supplying weaponry uh, may prevent the other side from immediately achieving uh, 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 tactical breakthroughs in the, by the military means, but it doesn't even begin to solve political issues. Well, the first session of, of, our, uh, of today's conference was about uh, historical narratives. And those historical narratives, of course, go back to the 11th and 12th century. But, you know, we, mo we focused more on what happened during the 20th century. Well, it started as a war of uh, some people, historians, some historians, uh, some politicians who, of course, took advantage of various historical myths or historical narratives to promote their agendas. What made uh, those narratives so uh, dangerous and destructive, um, each narrative had an exclusionary nature. Each narrative assumed that um, the other side was not part of the whole. For instance, some, some, some historians in, in, you know, to the west of Russia argued that Russia was never part of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, of, of real Europe never shared European values, and Russia and Russians were responsible for the Soviet Union and Soviet crimes. And on the Russian side, the response was delayed, but then they, you know, whipped themselves up into that patriotic indignation about, the, you know, what, uh, what Eastern Europeans call historical justice. They began, began to blame them for glorifying fascists, Nazi collaborators, to equaling Holocaust and Nazism with the crimes of Stalinism. And they took it very, very seriously and with a great degree of nervousness. But I guess the period when those narratives w clashed between 2005 and 2014 uh, destabilized the situation in, in some way. I mean, narratives were not the only factor that led to war, but narratives prepared the minds of people for jumping to quick decisions and quick solutions in terms of how to react to the new instability in Ukraine and uh, to the, you know, to what uh, people saw as, as as a potential separatism in Crimea.